I feel the same way that uh, probably every other speaker has felt in having an opportunity to share in this setting. Appreciate the uh, invitation by the elders at Stadium Boulevard Church, Tom Jones, and those who organized our seminar this year. And I want to express my appreciation to uh, uh, my father, who is not here, died three years ago for uh, raising me uh, in a Christian family. We had three boys in my family, and I'm extremely blessed to have three sons of my own. I hope and pray to God that I can raise my sons uh, in the manner that my father raised uh, myself and my brothers. I also want to express my gratitude to Chuck Lucas for the impact that he's had on my life and uh, so many of our lives. And it's because of the grace of God and because of a godly father and the influence of godly men like Chuck that I uh, have the opportunity to be here today. For the next few minutes, <clears throat> we uh, are going to examine the last letter that the Spirit wrote to the churches in Asia. Let's be turning our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will go in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The letter to the church of the Laodiceans is a unique letter in the sense that Jesus did not have one positive thing to say about that congregation. In every other instance, and as he approached those congregations in the uh, area of Asia, he had something good to say. Uh, as we look back and quickly review those churches, the church of Thyatira said, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. Uh, to the church at Sardis, he says, I know your deeds. He says, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Thank God for that. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. At the church in Philadelphia, he says, You have an open door. You've kept my word. You haven't denied my name. To the um, church in uh, Philadelphia, uh, let's see, gee whiz, lost my place. To the church in Ephesus or uh, Pergamon, he says, uh, You have remained true to my name. You did not renounce your faith. In every other instance, he had something good to say about those churches. Not so in Laodicea. He condemned the whole program. There were no conciliatory remarks. There were no pats on the back. Now, uh, if this uh, message seems a little bit negative, don't blame me. Let's just hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Jesus says, You're wretched. You're pitiful. You're poor and you're blind and you're naked. And he says, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. 
What's he saying? He says, I'm about to throw up. We've all had that feeling, I think, at one time or another. When when it's just been right here, man, we've just been on the verge. And it's taken just about every ounce of self-control to... to, uh, quench or to squelch that desire. But, but it's an involuntary response. It, it, it's, it's something that, that our bodies naturally respond to, to something that is going to be harmful to us. Jesus says, I, I wish, I wish you were cold. I wish you were hot. I, I don't want to do this. Nobody does. But he says, I can't help it. It's a violent response. It is an extreme response on the part of Jesus Christ. He's extremely upset with the situation at Laodicea. What's the matter, Jesus? You got a weak stomach? He says, no. It's not my stomach that has a problem. He says, you've got a problem with your attitude. Jesus doesn't have a weak stomach. He doesn't get upset over minor things. I believe that the lukewarmness is a major problem in the church today. And I'm not pointing the finger at the brotherhood this morning. The brotherhood is not here. I want to challenge us to examine our ministries and hear what the Spirit has to say to us. I love coming to these seminars. They're unique opportunities, aren't they? There there is no other seminar that I know of that that is of this quality and this type where we have the opportunity to be with fellow ministers uh, who have such a common goal and and aspirations in reaching the campuses for Christ. Uh, It's extremely encouraging to, to be together and to hear as we've had an opportunity of the great things that are going on in so many places. I need to hear that. Oh, we all need to hear that. Uh, I'm challenged by that. And we need to rejoice and praise God for the great things that are going on among us. And not in any way to be skeptical of those reports, or to be suspicious of those reports, or to be critical of those reports. I believe probably the most often asked question this week has been, how is it going in your ministry? I don't know how many times that's usually the, uh, you know, the first thing that we ask one another. And usually the response is good. Usually. But I want us to understand this morning that what we have to say about our ministries and what the Spirit has to say about our ministries may be vastly different. We may be poles apart as far as what we have to say about our ministries and what the Spirit has to say about our ministries. Laodicea made that mistake. You say, we're rich. We've prospered. We do not need a thing. And Jesus says, you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You're lukewarm. I want you to hear what the Spirit has to say about your ministry. And it's a bizarre picture that Jesus paints for us, isn't it? You've got this wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked individual running through the streets exclaiming, I'm rich! I'm rich! It's bizarre. That someone in such a pitiful state could be so absolutely deceived about his true spiritual condition. And that's just how subtle the temptation and the problem of lukewarmness is. That it can happen to any of us. Jesus did not agree with the Laodiceans' assessment of their ministry. He said, no, things aren't going good. Things are not going great. In fact, things aren't even going pretty well. He said, it's rotten. He says, I'm sick of it. And there's nothing more insulting than a lukewarm response to the great love and sacrifice that God has made in our behalf. Paul had it on straight. 
When he says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I, the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself up for me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, Paul says, The love of Christ compels us, because we are convinced that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 10, Paul says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Earlier in that same book, in chapter 4, Paul says, For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ. But you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You're honored, we're dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags. We're brutally treated. We're homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Willie Flores was making reference in his class yesterday about the movie Rocky. And Mickey said, your problem, son, is you become too civilized. You become too civilized. Paul never got civilized. He said, listen, we are the scum of the earth. We'll go around about in rags, brutally treated, homeless, persecuted. He says, we will gladly be regarded by the world to be scum and refuse. We are fools for Christ. That's the appropriate response. Jesus was willing to be regarded as a fool for us. Can't we do the same? He says, I'll be a fool for those people. He expects us to be fools for Him. That's the attitude that must characterize our personal lives and the lives of our congregations. And anything less than that is repulsive to our Lord and Savior. It's simply inappropriate. It doesn't fit. It is a gross misrepresentation to the world of how much God loves us. And we undermine and dilute the preciousness of the cross by our lukewarmness. We rob it of its power and greatness. Paul says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Listen, brothers and sisters, the people in the world need to see the full impact of the cross in our lives. They need to see its full impact. They need to see it all. We need to be exhibiting it all before them. They need to see a vivid portrayal of the appropriate response to the grace of God. And if we respond appropriately, it will be vivid. And the world will not believe that the gospel is the greatest story ever told until we live like it. Nietzsche said, I believe in your Redeemer when I see see that you've been redeemed. What do people see? A respectable religiosity? A respectable ministry? Is that what we're after? A respectable ministry? Are our churches simply more committed than the denominational world? Are our congregations simply more committed than the average church of Christ? It's got to be more than that. That, That's not our goal, simply to be more committed than other churches. It's got to be a total, complete, 
surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ and a surrender to the, his task of seeking and saving the lost. That's what it's got to be. The church in Laodicea evidently had prospered in some way. At some time, there are dangers in success, especially when it comes quickly. God's blessed us, hasn't He, brothers and sisters? He's blessed us. He's blessed some of our ministries more than we deserve. Many people here have accomplished in a very short period of time what others have labored for years and never accomplished. Our ministries have been more fruitful. We've reached more people for the cause of Christ than many people who have labored and poured out their hearts and their lives for years and never accomplished. Many of our ministries have made the hundred list. Praise God for that. And yet many times when we make the list, we get content. We get content with continuing to make the list a few years in a row. And uh, I'm sure we've just worked Rocky to death this week. So I'll kick a dead dog a little bit. Oh, uh, that's the way it was. He had achieved his goal quickly. And he had, quote unquote, successfully defended his title. But he had lost his edge. So many times it happens too fast. You change your passion for glory. Don't lose your grip on the dreams of the past. You must fight just to keep them alive. Sometimes we, we just lose that hunger, that passion for souls that we had when we initially went out into the ministry. Let's don't lose it. Let's fight to keep it alive. What did the Spirit say? He said, I know your deeds. He didn't say, I see the results. He didn't say, I see the fruit. He said, I know your deeds. Now, don't misunderstand me. The gospel will bring results. When it's preached consistently and boldly and clearly, it will bring great results. People will respond. Jesus gave us that promise in John chapter 15. I am the true vine and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, He trims clean so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. If our ministries are not being fruitful, that is an indictment. We must be fruitful. I am the vine and you are the branches. If anyone remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. It will happen. It says, and this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciple. The disciple. I believe that, don't you? Don't you believe that if we remain in Christ, that we will bear much fruit? In Luke chapter 12 and verse 48, the Bible says, To him who has been given much, much will be required. To him who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. I believe that too. We've all been given much, as Tom was saying last night. Even though you may have little strength, there is an open door. Much can be accomplished in our ministries. We've all been given much. I don't care where you are or where you got your training or how much talent you have. The Lord can still do 
something beyond our imaginations, as he said in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his great power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church. Jesus Christ is not going to be glorified until the church lives up to that promise. Until the church does accomplish immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. That He will not be glorified until then. So there much is required of all of us. That doesn't give any of us an excuse. But Jesus didn't say, I know your fruit. He says, I know your deeds. To him who has been given much, much will be required. To him who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. There are some people in this room who have been given much more. There are some people in this room who have more ability, God-given ability, than others. There are people in this room who may have been given more adequate and better training than others. There are people in this room who may have a better situation than others. The leadership of your congregation may be more positive and more supportive of your work. And growth may be more conducive as the result of your situation. I believe that. I think we have to admit that. You know, a hundred for a hundred conversions for some people takes an all-out effort. I spent three and a half years in Columbus, Ohio, working with Tom Yoakum, and uh, we worked. I, I made some mistakes in Columbus, Ohio, but one mistake I didn't make was that of being lukewarm. That's one mistake I didn't make. We worked. We scratched. We clawed. We fought for every inch and every conversion that we experienced there. The last year we were there, we converted 98 people. It took us three years of hard work to do that. Moved to Tallahassee a couple of years ago. We did in one year what we were unable to do in three years in Columbus, Ohio. Why? It was it because I, I worked harder? No, as a matter of fact, to be honest with you, I didn't work as hard. But we did more. It came easy. A hundred conversions for us that year was not that hard. And there's a temptation to get lazy. Just to let it happen. Just to let things go on instead of doing what we're really capable of doing. It's possible to convert a hundred people a year without giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord. You know it? It's possible to convert a hundred people a year without using your talent and your ability to the fullest. It's possible. I know it is. Personally, I know it is. In Christ Jesus, I do not lie. It's possible. And there are ministries here who should be converting 200, 300, and 400 people to Christ a year. There are ministries here that are capable of that. And that it, God expects it of us, and He's going to require it of us, brothers and sisters. And whenever we get satisfied with just making a hundred or whatever, without giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, we're in trouble. It's responsibility of the church leadership to keep the fires burning. That's our responsibility. 
We are going to control the thermostat in our churches. In Luke chapter 6, verse 40, a student will be like his teacher, good or bad. Hot or cold, lukewarm, they will be like you. And we can't escape that. We can't run from that. We can't turn our backs on that fact. Our congregations are going to reflect the kind of spiritual fervor that we exhibit in our lives. We must stay on the forefront of the battle lines. We've got to stay there. And we're never going to reach a point in our ministries, any of us, when we withdraw from the forefront. We were there when we started our ministries, weren't we? Why? Because nobody else was going to do it. If it was going to get done, we were going to have to do it. And many times when we accomplish the uh, discipling of other people, we withdraw. I'll tell you, it's easy to do. But if you do it, you will lose your credibility. And you will lose the respect of your congregation. And your congregation will follow your example. And they will be affected by your withdrawing however noble the reasons. Paul never became an administrator. He said, I never stopped warning you day and night with tears. I never stopped. He says, I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest after having preached to others, I myself would be disqualified. We can't find ourselves just preaching and teaching total commitment. We can't find ourselves just preaching and teaching evangelism or service or discipling or having a personal relationship to God. We've got to live it to the hilt. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, don't let anyone look down on you in verse 12 because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Verse 15, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. We've got to keep growing. We've got to keep going. We've got to set an example. That was why Paul was as great, had as such great ministries as he did. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, he says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen into me, put it into practice. That doesn't mean he's a perfect man. He just said he was just trying to be an example in every way. Just admitting that there's a problem is not enough. You know, some of us have made a yearly ritual of coming to seminars such as this and saying, we're not working as hard as we should. I'm not being as personally fruitful as I should. We're not discipling people like we should. I'm not praying like I should. And that kind of makes us feel good that we're not so prideful that we cover up. But that's not the solution to the problem. Just admitting that there is a problem is not the solution to the problem. In fact, it doesn't make things better at all. In fact, just admitting the problem makes things worse. In Luke chapter 12... The Bible says, verse 47, the servant that knows his master's will and does not get ready or do it will be beaten with many blows. It makes matters worse. Jesus told the Laodicean church, be earnest and repent. Let's not just be humble enough to admit the problem. Let's be humble enough to change. Let's be humble enough to repent. Let's be earnest about it. 
Ask your closest brother or sister in Christ. In our relationship, as well as you know me, how would you characterize my life? Am I hot? Can you see me really giving it all to Jesus Christ? We may not like the answer. It may be as difficult for us to hear as what the Laodicean church felt when they heard what Jesus had to say to them. But let's do something about it. Whatever the answer may be. <clears throat> I realize that uh, you know these things have not been uh, easy to listen to. They've not been easy to say for me. And many things I've shared with you today have come out of just a personal examination. I think we've needed to hear them. It's been exciting to be a part of campus ministry. To be on the cutting edge of a new restoration. We're there. And I really don't believe we're going to come back together next year and find out that we've converted less people than we did this year. I don't believe we're going to come back next year and, and find that out. But all the messages and classes at uh, this year's seminar have been outstanding. I believe in us. I believe with all my heart that we'll not only hear what the Spirit has to say, the Laodicean church, be earnest and repent. Let's not just be humble enough to admit the problem. Let's be humble enough to change. Let's be humble enough to repent. Let's be earnest about it. Ask your closest brother or sister in Christ. In our relationship, as well as you know me, how would you characterize my life? Am I hot? Can you see me really giving it all to Jesus Christ? We may not like the answer. It may be as difficult for us to hear as what the Laodicean church felt when they heard what Jesus had to say to them. But let's do something about it. Whatever the answer may be. <clears throat> I realize that, uh, you know, these things have not been uh, easy to listen to. They've not been easy to say for me. And many things I've shared with you today have come out of just a personal examination. I think we've needed to hear them. It's been exciting to be a part of campus ministry. To be on the cutting edge of a new restoration. We're there. And I really don't believe we're going to come back together next year and find out that we've converted less people than we did this year. I don't believe we're going to come back next year and, and find that out. But all the messages and classes at uh, this year's seminar have been outstanding. I believe in us. I believe with all my heart that we'll not only hear what the Spirit has to say, but that we'll take it to heart and that we'll do something about it. May God bless us in our work together as we strive to win the world for Christ. Thank you very much.